Scott. Welcome everyone here in the Del Mar Center Hall, those on Zoom and those on YouTube later. My name is Linda McCabe. I am the chair of the Sea Ranch Forum. And before we start today, there's just a few safety things. For those in the hall, if you need it, the doors are the fire doors. They say exit over top, there you go. If you need to use the bathroom, it's outside and across the sidewalk and the bathrooms are there. And may we never need it. There's an AED behind us, okay? <laughs> so I'd like to welcome Linda Hopkins. She is our supervisor on the Sonoma County Board of Supervisors. She represents the fifth district. This district is geographically diverse and covers the entire Sonoma Coast from the Sea Ranch down to Bodega Bay, the towns and hamlets on the Russian River corridor from Forestville to Jenner, and the city of Sebastopol through to the western edges of Santa Rosa. Before joining the Super Board of Supervisors, Linda was an organic farmer, former community journalist with Sonoma West Publishers, and a graduate of Stanford University. Bachelor's degree is in coastal land use, and she has a master's degree in land use policy. She was first elected in November 2016, and during her time in office, she has had to manage many emergencies, including the 2017 Tubbs and Nuns fires, the 2019 Kincaid fire. In 2020 came the glass fire part of the LNU Lightning Complex fires, Walbridge, Stewart's, and Myers fires, along with droughts, flooding, the COVID-19 pandemic that disrupted every aspect of our lives, and severe unpredictable storms due to the effects of climate change. And that doesn't even mention the normal political issues such as budgets, funding, state re regulations, and land use. We are grateful she is spending a few hours with her most geographically distant constituent. Thank you so much um, for the warm welcome. I really appreciate it. And apologies for my tardiness this morning. I was so proud of myself. I was supposed to get here 20 minutes early and then um, wound up behind a few different Caltrans trucks going very slowly and all the one ways somehow hit them just wrong. Um, but I'd like to provide sort of a brief overview of some of the major issues going before the Board of Supervisors right now that are of particular interest to the North Coast, starting with the local coastal plan. Um, I want to say that you have been very well represented in advocacy on the local coastal plan and really, really appreciate um, the partnership with some of the folks up here who have been involved really over the last 10 years as we, as we have set out to update our LCP. Um, we are really now down to two primary outstanding issues um, that were discussed at the Board of Supervisors last week, and that is surrounding vegetation management as well as agricultural grazing along the coast. Um, with respect to vegetation management, I do want to announce that we are holding a meeting um, at the Timber Cove Fire Station next Monday, April 17th at 9 a.m. We will be having a sort of site tour of nearby areas where we can see tree mortality and some of the challenges with the creation of defensible space from 9 to 11, and then from 11 to 1 or maybe 11 to 2, depending on how long it, um, it takes us, we're going to be going back to hash out some policy. Um, what we heard was feedback from our CAL FIRE partners, as well as other North Coast registered um, professional foresters, that you know, the staff's proposal to streamline vegetation management, particularly as it pertains to defensible space, was really inadequate and very cumbersome and very expensive for landowners. And so the goal really is to streamline that process to kind of eliminate duplicative and redundant bureaucratic processes to try to make it easier um, for homeowners, you know, particularly sort of in the hills and upland. Um, and I think that that's, even though you have a very robust vegetation management um, through the Sea Ranch Association, I think that we all know that we're only as strong as our neighbors. And so ultimately um, we hope that this will sort of increase the access to local just, you know, within that 
that sort of defensible space area for folks to be able to clear their home. Unfortunately, we have actually had to intervene when constituents were fined tens of thousands of dollars for literally cutting down a dead tree in their backyard. Um, and of course that we have seen, you know, through the storms over the last couple of months, the tremendous damage that was unfortunately inflicted um, on many of the homes in the Sea Ranch and the North Coast as a result of drought stressed and diseased forests then being struck with um, wind and precipitation. So the other um, topic that's going to be discussed and the meeting will unfortunately be a little further for you, but on the South Coast, we'll be holding a meeting in Bodega Bay at 9 a.m. on May 1st to discuss agricultural issues, particularly as it pertains to the ability to graze on timberland as well as fencing and kind of easement requirements as folks go through a development um, permit process. And one of the, the concerns that was raised at the board meeting was that if folks want to simply allow their animals to graze, the Coastal Commission had suggested that we insert extraordinarily restrictive fencing requirements um, in much of the coastal zone and riparian areas that would actually not be suitable to contain livestock because they were required to be, I think it was like 18 inches above the ground and only 36 inches high. And I don't know any livestock who wouldn't figure a way to get through that fence very, very quickly. Um, so that was a concern that was raised. I also want to mention um, and actually thank Chief Placos for um, sort of the partnership and camaraderie after the January storms. Um, number one, I think it was really critical that there was a strong relationship between, um, now we call it, it used to be transportation and public works, now we call it Sonoma County PI or Sonoma County Public Infrastructure, kind of coordinating in real time with a lot of our fire agencies to try to bring resources to clear the tr these trees from the road, um, but also sort of the ability to connect both um, Menka as well as Bonnie with some of our resources in the Department of Emergency Management to sort of talk through funding options. Unfortunately, funding options are often limited um, in the wake of these disasters, and they're also very cumbersome and slow. And so it's my hope that we can kind of build on some of those early meetings and actually leverage that into advocacy. Because one of the things that we're seeing is that we are consistently struck by winter storms that damage our public infrastructure and actually reduce our critical evacuation pathways for fire season. So you go from flood season and storm season to six months later, you're in fire season and your infrastructure has been degraded to a point where it's actually very dangerous, right? And where we've got one way in and one way out communities, right? Moscow Road, obviously far from here, but as a great example where we had a slide um, back in 2019 that has still not been repaired because the FEMA processes are so slow, we are faced with a new slide that could literally have resulted in folks having no access to their property. We have a slide on the east and a slide on the west now. And so we're trying to figure out ways of expediting this process. And it's my hope that maybe we can work together. I also know that you have some very well-connected folks, um, the sort of state legislature up here. And maybe we can work together on advocacy to try and improve FEMA reimbursement processes and also to make them more accessible, not just to larger governments like the county, but also smaller governments as well as HOAs that I think um, sometimes kind of struggle to access the funds and resources needed to recover from these sudden disasters. I also want to mention um, that upcoming with the Board of Supervisors. We're actually going to be having our budget presentations this month in April, but the formal budget hearings are in June. That said, all of our funding requests are due by April 17th. Is it April 17th or April? Yeah, I think so, April 17th. So that really means that we've kind of got a week um, you know, to come up with any requests and uh, the deadline always sneaks up. But if there are any sort of outstanding needs that you have um, that would be sort of a public resource. So unfortunately we can't fund things like private road repairs um, or sort of private bridges. But if there are needs maybe potentially in partnership with the fire district, I would be happy to put in a budget request. No guarantee, because we don't know at this point how much money a general fund sort of one-time funding allocations will have available, but I'm always happy to ask. Um, I also want to mention that um, your Coast Mac is doing fantastic work and having conversations about vacation rentals, um, about sort of other salient issues on the local coastal plan. And they are currently meeting every other month and really, really grateful um, for Chair Emeritus, uh, Marty Campbell, and um, current Chair Brian, who is in the Bodega Bay area. Um, a couple other quick notes. So um, I know that you all have your own water system, but I know that you also likely have um, neighbors who do not. And so we did just pass a well ordinance in Sonoma County, um, which will sort of better steward our groundwater resources. Um, it will actually create a discretionary process for new wells that are sort of more than a de minimis water user. And so the, the goal there is to ensure that we are not dewatering our streams and that we are actually protecting the public trust, which involves ensuring that we have sort of fisheries habitat in our streams and that 
that kind of cumulative impact of additional well permits is not actually um, going to lead to resource concerns as it pertains to our salmon and fisheries. Um, we are also in continuing discussions. I think the other sort of slightly outstanding piece of the local coastal plan is with respect to the vacation rental um, process. So we are going through a process um, outside of the local coastal plan, uh, sort of generally, that will actually allow us to implement business licenses in the coast for vacation rentals. This will not address issues of concentration. It will only sort of address those nuisance issues, like talking about you know quiet hours after a certain amount of time, or establishing standards for lighting so that your neighbors can't sort of you know shine lights, or there aren't lights when someone comes in and checks in at the last minute, you know, at 11:30 or midnight, um, and kind of bothers you. And so it's really designed to kind of create standards, but not yet limit the concentration. However, we have heard substantial interest in the community and moving forward with concentration conversations as quickly as we can. So we are trying to, once the local coastal plan goes before um, the Coastal Commission, really look at the implementation of something more broad. I know that you all have had a lot of conversations with that up here and really, really curious to hear additional feedback on the process there. Finally, um, I will end on a fun and furry note. Um, we are actually going to be holding a sea otter summit um, in, in sort of a partnership with Congressman Jared Huffman, who is going to be our special guest. We have also confirmed participation from both tribal chairman um, Saris, who represents the South Coast, as well as tribal chairman Franklin, who represents the North Coast. Um, at the Sea Otter Summit, which will bring together subject matter and scientific experts from across the state of California, as well as agencies um, that are responsible for the reintroduction of sea otters into ecosystems that used to host sea otters, but which were unfortunately eradicated um, really based on Russian colonization in the area at the time that Fort Ross was established. And so there, you know, there are tremendous benefits potentially from the reintroduction of sea otters, and this all came about um, actually from a conversation that I had with Brock Dolman at the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, who when he was, he's very passionate about beaver reintroduction in Sonoma County. And I mentioned that I've been talking about sea otters for years. And he said, well, you'll never believe it, but the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service just released a 90 page study on that. So we're leveraging on uh, the work that was done by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that looked at a feasibility analysis for the reintroduction of sea otters in Northern California and actually also um, coastal Oregon. And so we're very excited about that possibility. It's not something that's going to happen over Overnight because this is government, we move very slowly, and there are so many different levels of government involved in this conversation. But it's a process that we're excited to kick off, and there's a lot of enthusiasm um, at the federal level, as well as with our um, sort of local agencies and um, and scientific community as well. And so the benefits to that include actually potentially even enhanced carbon sequestration, the proliferation of kelp forests, which being a keystone species, otters have a tremendously beneficial impact on um, the sort of marine ecosystems and kelp and can ultimately actually, even though they are predators and carnivores, um, help actually rehabilitate fisheries by the sort of expansion of habitat in support of our kelp forests. So I think that I'll leave it at that. And I'm happy to answer any questions later in the program. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so now, now I, I, I forgot to tell people what the meeting is, the structure of it. So now we're gonna have representatives from different public health and safety agencies and public agencies to discuss their experiences with our recent severe storms, especially the bomb cyclone on January 4th. Um, and we do have someone who is supposed to be coming on Zoom. Um, Scott, do you see Lieutenant Tim Duke from the Sonoma County Sheriff's Office online? I. Uh... I have a Tim that's on telephone, and so if Tim would like to unmute and speak up. If, um, if he is Lieutenant Tim Duke. Correct. Why don't we move forward, and, and if he okay. comes up, I'll let you know. Okay, so, so we're going to have a series of, of representatives speak and then we will um, have a short break um, so everyone can use the bathroom and then we'll come back and then we will open it up for public comment or questions to um, Supervisor Hopkins if you want to share your experiences or if you want to ask her questions that's the time okay so we're going to start with Chief Bonnie Placos from the North Sonoma Coast Fire Protection District, and she has 
visual aids for us. Hello? So hi, everybody. Anybody who doesn't know, I'm Bonnie Blakos. I'm the volunteer fire chief for North Sonoma Coast Fire. And uh, I just have a little, just a little uh, quick presentation here, run through some slides on recapping what happened with the emergency services during the storm. Some of you may know this, some of you may not. But uh, anyway, um, we'll try and be quick. Hopefully this is going to work. and hit advance. Go. Um, January 4th, what happened? The power went out about 9.30 a.m. Uh, trees started falling down in Timber Cove, about 11.30 up here. They started falling and they kept falling. I don't have a count of how many trees went down for you. John Prescott might. Um, but uh, I can say that just, just our fire department, we had uh, about 40 documented 911 dispatches, but there were many, many more. We really lost count. And a lot of times we responded to an incident on the way to an incident. So um, a lot happened that day. Um, and a lot of them couldn't be dealt with because they involved power lines and they couldn't be cleared until PG&E uh, got to them. Um, so it was, it was quite the day. <laughs> um, we responded constantly all day. We really emphasized keeping roadways open, uh, checking for you know houses that had trees on them to see if they had propane damage or if they had people trapped inside, and in opening up driveways um, if, of occupied houses so that people could get out. Uh, county roads, we were very grateful. County roads had a great response out here, and they really worked hard, and their priority was keeping Annapolis and Stewart's Point Skag Springs Road open, which they did, except for a little short period, so that was really great. Um, there was a task force that uh, the county had prepared for flooding and had two upstaff task forces, that's like a group of five engines, fire engines, to respond to flooding, and they didn't get flooding. Um, and they tried to send one of the task forces up here to us on that day, but they couldn't get through. They got as far as Timber Cove, that's as far as they could get, but they did help a little bit there. Um, and uh, it was tough to keep the highway open. Caltrans didn't really make it up here until the nighttime. So, um, a lot of the times we, nobody could get through on Highway 1. Uh, we had one citizen uh, badly injured by a falling tree. Uh, we had CLSD and, and um, there that's happening. You can see. Uh, <laughs> right. so most, this is what most of the highways look like all day long. Um, uh, a Coast Life Support District had patients they really needed to get to the ambulance. They tried various ways and all the roads and they couldn't get through. So eventually they had to return to RCMS because there just wasn't any place to go. All right, we're having a technical issue. Yeah, keep going, keep going. Uh, so, oh, <laughs> keep going for that page. Yeah, um, RCMS um, uh, stepped up, they staffed up and they uh, in their urgent care and they cared for patients through the night. The one patient with really traumatic injuries, um, the road was open about 2 a.m. and they were managed to uh, get north and they got escorted by South Coast Fire, who was also here to keep the trees out of the way. Keep going. Uh, go ahead. Something that rarely happens, um, it was the rain continued, it was so hard and the trees are falling and it was dark, it became too dangerous to respond to calls. And so South Coast, North Coast, Timber Cove, all of us just stopped responding. There's a picture up of a uh, uh, Sea Ranch loader being driven by our assistant chief with a tree on him. So that was not good. <laughs> and um, yeah, everybody's okay. Uh, but we had to actually had to stop responding. Next. The aforementioned task force um, actually uh, was able to come up the next day, January 5th, when the, it was only spotty rain off and on. 
Uh, we uh, established an incident command post at the South Station, and, and we had a wonderful spreadsheet created by TSRA and online so we could share information. We just kept updating the spreadsheet back and forth, what was reported, who was going where, what had been fixed. And I thought you might like to enjoy. This is what it looks like when the cavalry arrives <laughs> at the station. And that's um, my pointer isn't working. That's our assistant chief, and this is our this is our organizational system for tracking all those things that happened on January fifth. Uh, again, it was really great to uh, see all the all the help. And you've all seen all these pictures, but I just thought I'd put up a few to remind everybody of what were the kinds of things we were dealing with on that day and in the following days. And we had. Uh, a lot of responders is fire department cutting up on highway one. Everybody's seen this picture and know that that Cal Fire person did not drop a tree on the car. <laughs> <laughs> he is <laughs> he is removing the tree that fell the previous day, and we're really grateful that our security officer was not injured in this incident. And just more, more trees, more trees, more trees. Something interesting that happened is on January 8th, there was another atmospheric river and we had 18 more 911 calls, which in a normal year would just be an astonishing day. But we were like, oh, well, yeah, 18, so what? <laughs> we, we, we managed to keep up with it. And also by then there was a lot of this all over the place, PG&E and private contractors and the cleanup work was really underway. Now uh, the power outage was a big deal. The north end of Sea Ranch and some areas uh, had lost power for seven days. Some areas, south end and other parts of Annapolis, were out of power for almost 11 days. Uh, the question is, actually, what uh, would have helped? Um, I think we probably could have done with additional resources staged here before the storm, like maybe additional county roads and loaders and things at the county road yard. They did get there. Um, uh, the uh, who knows where the problem was going to be? And if the task force was was here instead of down in the in the river, it would have been great. But who knew that we were going to get a cyclone and they didn't flood? Uh, it would have been really great for us to have some kind of portable power to help with the community, especially up in Annapolis. And I'm just I want to thank uh, Supervisor Hopkins. We did apply for a tourism impact grant, and we just got to sixty thousand dollars, and we're going to use it basically for that for two portable, towable. Uh, power sources, the one with the light tower to have available in the next the next power out. And I can't speak in public without advertising the picnic. So March 28th, everybody come. It's the 50th anniversary picnic too. And this year is the 50th anniversary. This year is the 50th anniversary of our volunteer fire department and our association, our official association with Cal Fire. Thank you, Bonnie, for everything that you've done in your agency. Um, is Tim Duke available yet? Uh, I have not seen Tim Duke okay. yet. Do you see anyone and we else? No, he's busy okay. with his duty. Yeah. Um, do you see anyone else that might be an official representative? Just let me know, um, as opposed to civilians, because there are a couple other agencies that had been infer invited. And I invited them to also come by Zoom, but I didn't have any. We'll keep an eye out for them and we'll ask them to announce themselves in chat okay. and I'll let you know. Okay, got it. So next I would like to call Jason Warner, Chief of the South Coast Fire Protection District. And yes, he is not part of Supervisor Linda Hopkins um, constituency, but in normal times, the South Coast and the North Coast Fire Protection Districts work in partnership with one another. And that was not a normal time. So I wanted to have him speak as well. Thank you, Jason Warner, South Coast Fire Chief. Um, can we adjust your mic, please? You can that any better? Yes. Oh, that's better, that's better. Okay. Jason Warner, South Coast Fire Department Chief. Um, we cover the Wallala area up uh, close to Point Arena and east uh, about halfway over to Boonville. Um, I appreciate the offer to come speak. Basically. We do work hand in hand with all the agencies and it takes all of us to work together in order to accomplish the overall goal. Um, you know, these storm events were basically the same for all of us. I can sit here and give Bonnie the same spiel that she rattled through. Um, you're probably gonna hear the same from some other agencies that were here as well. But the end goal was to take care of our folks as safely as we could. 
Um, we started about seven o'clock that morning with running calls. Um, through the course of that storm adventure, the, the week long or so, we ran about 130 calls. We ran about 33% of our annual call volume in the first two weeks of the year. Um, same, like I said, pretty much the same story for all of us. Um, I know on the first day, it kind of came in waves. We hit a point where we had our world kind of under control. Sea Ranch was getting hit pretty hard, so we were able to send an engine down to assist them. Um, and it just goes back and forth both ways. We're each there to help each other. Um, we worked in conjunction with Coast Life Support District, making sure that they could get to the calls that they needed. Um, we worked with RCMS, trying to work through that. Um, you guys were fortunate, you had a very strong presence of county roads up here. We had less of a presence in Mendocino County. Um, Highway 1 gets closed at the Garcia from flooding quite frequently. So our residents' only way out is to the south, sometimes over Fish Rock Road. Um, that frequently gets closed as well. You guys keeping that open really benefits the whole Mendonoma coast. Uh, did lots of firsts through this storm. We did on Thursday morning, we private hired two loaders to run through with the lack of county roads support that we had. We went through, opened up all the county roads and state highways. Um, so that was about a 16 hour adventure. We had those resources out there. Um, we hired an excavator that we ran around with to open roads as they were coming. Like Bonnie said, the trees were just falling too fast for us to do it with traditional means. Uh, if you would have sat there and talked about, you know, your guys' 40 calls in a day or any of that, those are huge days. Normally we'll go cut one or two trees out in a day. We can do it with our personnel. Uh, but we wound up having to supplement with equipment based off of just the, the sheer volume. Um, questions that you guys have directly from the storm? Really, like I said, I can keep going, but it's all the same stuff that you've heard from Bonnie, uh, other than just all the agencies working together so well. So thank you guys for coming and we can answer questions later. Thank you. Okay. Linda, I uh, just would like to let you know, Judy Bauer is here representing the Ocean Ridge Airport in Gualala, Good. where the base camp for pg e was. Yes, okay. Um, I'll, I'll change a little and, and let Julie speak if she's, in, if she's ready. Yes, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so I'm just going to read a written statement that I had prepared in case I could not be here today by Zoom. So my name is Julie Bauer, and I manage Ocean Ridge Airport in Wallala for my father-in-law, John Bauer, who owns and operates this airport. It is the only privately owned public use airport in the region, and this means that John pays to keep the airport in operation as a public use airport. The airport is not eligible for any type of public funding because it is privately owned. The airport property is private land and it is only public as it relates to aircraft operations. <clears throat> John's father acquired the airport in the late 1970s when it was up for auction and the Bauer family did not construct the runway, but we have made numerous improvements to the airport property over the decades, including the construction of hangars and adding a taxiway and a tie down area. The airport sits at about 940 feet in elevation and it's about 2,600 feet in length. So it's actually a rather small airport. The motto of the airport is that we are above the fog and beyond the smog. It is also John's home where he raised his family, including my husband. On average throughout the year, we probably see less than one landing per day. Given the low traffic, the airport does not pay for itself and must be subsidized by John. It's always been important to him to do this for the community, not just for tourism, but for emergency preparedness. The airport is frequently used for medical evacuation helicopter services, such as CalSTAR and REACH. CAL FIRE has stationed some helicopters there in the past as well. And PG&E contractors have used the airport recently for staging its helicopter chainsaws when doing uh, tree work along its remote power lines in our region. We are all, uh, aware that Ocean Ridge Airport may become vital in evacuations or supply drops during a big earthquake, storm, or wildfire. John has always been firm in his conviction that the airport must be maintained for these inevitabilities. Because if it's not the airport, then where? <clears throat> My husband and I agree with and support John in this stance. I was contacted by someone in the land acquisition office of PG&E a day or two into the series of cyclone storms that hit the Wallala area the first week of January this year. This woman wanted to know if we would be willing to let PG&E use 
quote, some of the space at the airport to stage machinery and equipment while it worked to repair the extensive damage to its electrical grid throughout our region. I did not hesitate to tell her, of course. We have always known that <clears throat> a day would come when the airport would be needed in an emergency situation. And in my mind, there was no other option than to readily agree to help in this way. The next morning in the driving rain, I met with a fellow from pg and &E at the airport. I had planned to give the company permission to use select paved areas that I knew could withstand the extreme weight of its heavy trucks and machines. I told him that the runway was off limits because it was not, it is not truly paved. The people who built it simply laid down one to two inches of gravel and covered it with a thin slurry seal, which we've added to over the years. Even in normal winters, this thin layer of asphalt slurry chips and cracks because the water table reaches just under the surface. And the clay soils up there retain the moisture for a very long time. It turns out this fellow was searching for a space for a full base camp to house over 400 personnel, plus trucks, equipment, machinery, supplies, and all of the support needed for such a large operation. We talked about what would happen if we as the Bowers had declined the use of the whole airport. Could PG&E get the power restored across our rural region without using the runway and just using properly paved areas of our airport? Given the flooding of the Garcia River to the north that cuts off road access from Ukiah and Fort Bragg uh, PG&E operations, he said it would extend the repairs for many weeks without the airport, not to mention the added strain to its hundreds of workers who were being called into the region who would have to commute back and forth from the south. Saying no to this alternative was clearly not in the best interests of our community members who were left in the cold and dark without power, nor to the pg and &E workers. John Bauer and I discussed the pros and cons and agreed that allowing pg and &E to use the entire property was the right thing to do. pg and &E pledged to make timely repairs to return the airport to use. As soon as I issued the NOTAM or notice to air missions for the airport to close the airport, pg and &E rolled in during our site visit, the Garcia River had actually flooded and closed the highway to the north. All PG&E crews and equipment were rerouted to come in from the south. Within a couple of hours of issuing that NOTAM, a small city had formed at Ocean Ridge Airport. There had been many dozens of PG&E trucks of supplies and equipment sitting on the side of Highway 1 just waiting for the official go-ahead to set up operations at the airport. Over the next day or so, PG&E brought in trailers for everything you can imagine, security, traffic control, offices, communications, bunkers for over 400 people, showers, laundry facilities, toilets, R&R trailers, medical, and more. Local restaurants were hired uh, to do catering to feed these hundreds of people. Nearly every available surface of the property was used in and around hangars, John's house, everywhere. We did coordinate to keep an area clear on the north end of the runway for medical evacuation operations. Huge traffic ready mats were laid down on most of the runway to help prevent damage from all of this, but it was futile with the huge amount of rain. <clears throat> the runway was severely damaged, but PG&E was successful in making its repairs and restoring power to our region in a short amount of time. Although for those who were without power the longest, it may not have felt that it was quick enough. But just imagine how much longer it would have taken if PG&E didn't have its stockpile of replacement power poles, massive spools of high voltage power line and all those skilled workers in Malala. PG&E was on site from January 8th through January 20th. The airport has remained, <clears throat> uh, the airport has remained closed since the base camp folded due to the extensive runway damage. PG&E has hired contractors to repair the runway and other surfaces damaged by its operations, but we've been at the mercy of this spring and win winter weather. It will need at least a solid month of dry weather to make the repairs. It has been working in the meantime on soils testing to find the right pavement mix for our soil type, creating a stormwater, stormwater pollution prevention plan, applying for the repair permit and getting highly accurate Trimble GPS coordinates of the runway and more. It's been a long process and it hasn't even really started yet. Our hangar tenants and regular airport users have been very patient with the whole slow repair process. Some of them are suffering because their livelihoods depend on having a functioning airport. It is my understanding that these folks are filing claims with PG&E to recover their losses. Although we are all a little frustrated by, by how long the repair work is taking, we still wouldn't have changed our minds in granting permission to PG&E to use the airport as a base camp, if we'd, even if we'd known what the timeline would be. It was still the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, Julie.
Do you have any questions for her? Okay, thank you so much. Um, next, uh, Marshall Turbeville from CAL FIRE. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having me here. I'm just going to talk a little bit. Um, I guess the theme will be jurisdiction. So really, Cal Fire as a state agency has no real jurisdiction for the flood response or any storm response. It's only through the agreement with the North Sonoma Coast Fire Protection District that Cal Fire is really even here in that. Um, and then on the larger scale of jurisdiction, county line that Chief Warner talked about, there's Highway 1, which is Caltrans, there's Sonoma County Roads with PI, which is Annapolis, Drew Point, Skag Springs, there's Mendocino County Roads. Out the other, only agencies that don't really care about jurisdiction are fire departments. We go anywhere people call us. We don't care about the river. We don't care about whose road it is. We'll go. If this was a city, you wouldn't hear the fire departments talking about trees now. They wouldn't even go. It'd be the public infrastructure or somebody else handling it all. The fire department does it 24-7, day in, day out. And I don't think Chief Warner talked about it, but I think there was a point, at least a point that night, and I wasn't out here that night, I was covering from my own injury, um, but I, it was just too dangerous. That's never been done before either. So we all, yeah, there was a lot of unique things that happened. And so we talk a lot about wildfires and precedent setting and weird situations we get into. Well, now it's happening in the winter. And isolated community takes everyone working together. Being without power for 14 days, California, that's or 11 days, that's kind of almost unheard of as well. But that's that's the reality out here. And so you know, we're always going to respond. Um, if you guys have heard me talk about this with mitigation and preparedness and prevention, is now what do we do to be better prepared for the next time? Everyone just stays home, get a bunch of water, a bunch of batteries, and good luck? Or do we go out and try to mitigate the risk? Because all those trees down, there's probably how many more out there in the forest right now? How many of the trees just got pushed off the road out of the county's right away? And it's like, well, not our problem, we're out. You know, how much more is going on out there that we're going to pay for later on? Problem later on with the wildfire or when we're dealing with trees. So I'm a little frustrated that we're not being as proactive as we can be with uh, vegetation management and, and keeping right of ways and roads open. And the supervisor talked about the coastal plan. Um, but when it comes down to response, that's what you see the fire departments do. That's what you see the animals do. Everyone just works together. That doesn't happen as much as you think in the rest of this county or in this state. I've seen CHP officers go over the side on a cliff rescue. I've seen Fish and Wildlife officers do traffic control. No one cares about what patch or what jurisdiction they got. So thanks for having Cal Fire be part of your community. I'll always be here to come out and talk to you guys. It's great, the camaraderie out here with the fire agencies and everybody else that works in public safety. and. Uh, just remember, if there's something we can do proactively, and maybe it's multi-benefit where it benefits wildfire as well as flood as well as the wind, um, you know, maybe that's something to start thinking about now that we can actually start this conversation. So uh, thank you. Thanks for having me here today. And uh, not that we want to do this again, but I guarantee you we'll be better prepared next time, unfortunately. Fortunately. <laughs> thank, thank you, Marshall. Um, Bronwyn? from Coast Life Support District, affectionately known as CLSD. Hello, my name is Bronwyn Golly. I'm the operations captain with Coast Life Support District. Thank you for having us here. So we cover from um, the Fort Ross Timber Cove area at Reef Campground all the way north to Irish Beach and about 17 to 20 miles inland. So we're cooperators with all of the fire departments, Timber Cove, North Sonoma Coast, South Coast Fire and Redwood Coast Fire. And um, we were, as said by many, very impacted by, um, by the storms. We had 44 calls within that operational period, which was 22 more than we normally do within that period. Um, as illustrated by uh, Chief Placos's photo earlier, we were, um, had two transports down to Santa Rosa, one of which was the gentleman that was hit by the tree in front of the ambulance um, that was trying to take a patient down to Santa Rosa. Um, prior to this storm, um, we had looked at uh, sort of how we run our operations. We already had in coordination with Timber Cove Fire, one of our ambulances is now permanently staged um, down at their fire district. 
and they use that as a rescue and then as a um, patient moving vehicle um, when needs be like one of these emergencies as well as we had taken one of our ambulances and placed it north in Manchester because as mentioned the Garcia River does flood. I had talked to our CMS um, actually on this day sort of in preparation for um, the rain that was anticipated that weekend um, thinking that it, maybe it was going to be the long lines of the flooding in 2016 2017 where Grunville flooded and we only had one access off the coast and preparing our CMS um, to be able to bring patients there, not believing that it would happen on that day. Um, the coordination between all the agencies was, uh, was fantastic. Um, so our ambulances were limited for um, about a 14 hour period where we couldn't get off the coast, but we worked with our CMS, worked with the fire departments, and we're finally able at two, midnight, I believe, to take a patient, the gentleman that had been hit by the tree, um, up to Fort Bragg. It was the only hospital that we could access. Um, it is not a trauma center, um, neither is RCMS, but RCMS was staffed and available with a PA who was able to care for that patient, um, coordinated um, via, via video link with the ER doctor um, up at Fort Bragg, who then worked on care for him. He was prepped. They also talked to Santa Rosa Memorial and through a multi-stage um, patient care, he was eventually taken to Memorial and is home and is doing well. So coordination with North Sonoma Coast, uh, South Coast Fire and Redwood Coast Fire um, and RCMS really helped us um, be available for our community. And it's a great place to be. So thank you very much. Thank you. Now. I'm going to read um, testimony from Redwood Coast Medical Services CEO, Ara Chakrabarti. This is um, delivered by proxy. He had wanted to be here, but couldn't. So on Wednesday, January 4th, we lost our power mid-morning, and we were fortunate that our emergency generator came on right away, so our ability to care for our patients was not interrupted. As the day progressed, the storm picked up intensity and roads started closing because of flooding or fallen trees. Helicopters were grounded due to the severe storm. As conditions deteriorated, I reached out to Dave Crowell at CLSD to plan for an emergency situation if the ambulances were not able to transport patients out of the area. He had already spoken with our urgent care provider and Leon before being asked, volunteer to be available all night. Between our CMS, CLSD, South Coast Fire, and North Sonoma Coast Fire, we had decided that RCMS Urgent Care would receive patients past normal hours if needed. I informed the Mendocino Public Health Officer and County Emergency Coordinator of our plans. It was also decided there would be two BLS ambulances in two cover corners of our coverage area, Timber Cove and Manchester. At around 5 p.m., I went upstairs to discuss how we would cover the night and discovered this had already been planned by our team members. They had already performed a full day of work, but they intended on staying as long as needed. One team member went out in the midst of the storm before the stores closed and brought back sandwiches and other food for the team members who were staying after hours. I stayed in the clinic until about 10.30 that night. By the time I left, a number of patients were brought in by emergency responders, including a serious trauma patient. Our clinicians, nurses, medical assistants, and support staff stayed until the early hours of the morning till the last patient was transported by ambulance to the Fort Bragg Hospital. That night, I saw a team that was professional, effective, efficient, while also caring and compassionate. It warmed my heart, and I feel proud to be a part of such a marvelous group of professionals. That night, we changed from being a clinic into being a critical care hospital without benefit of blood bank. Because that is what our community needed. Our team members stepped up to help even though they had the same problems as the rest of the community. No power, food getting spoiled in their refrigerator, small children or elderly parents waiting at home, but they stayed to help our community without hesitation. Our CMS serves our community by providing vaccines, well child visits, treatments for tick bites and collapsing lungs, 
all the way to diagnosing cardiac failure. We do all of that plus dental care and behavioral health in a location with the longest ambulance ride to a hospital in the state of California. We are one of only a few facilities that are allowed to receive emergency medical transport that is not connected with a hospital. Our CMS was founded in 1979 and has become an essential part of the health and well being of this coastal community. And we thank you for your continued support. Okay. Um, Micheline, yeah, you're, you're next because you're also healthcare. Yes, come up here and speak. She is with the Mendonoma Health Alliance. Hello, everybody, and thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Micheline White. I'm the executive director of Mendonoma Health Alliance. Uh, we provide health and wellness services to the Mendonoma Coast, which stretches down to the Timber Cove area all the way up through Irish Beach in Mendocino County. And what we primarily do is care coordination. So we're helping people navigate the healthcare system. Oftentimes we have um, lots of people with chronic conditions who need help getting to their specialists um, transportation wise and also getting the referral sent through um, and follow up care. And so in addition to the care coordination, we help tackle those um, social determinants of health, which in times of storm damage and, and disaster um, become the focal point of people's issues. So people without high incomes are at home, um, not working. Their children are at home, not at school. Um, their food that's damaged in the storms um, or in power outages, they no longer have, and they don't have the money to um, restock. And in a lot of cases, people are out of power. Um, and so there are other issues that go along with that, clean water, um, heat, and so our organization outside of doing our health and wellness services also helps address all of those issues. Uh, during this most recent storm, we collaborated with the Community Foundation of Mendocino County, and we distributed over $35,000 directly into the hands of our community members in both Mendocino and Sonoma County. And that money was used to help reimburse people for fuel for their generators. It was helped to um, fill up refrigerators um, after the power came back on. It was also helped to pay people for the lost wages they had because they could not work during the storm weather. So we were able to help over 90 families in the community, which represents hundreds of people and um, lots and lots of children too. Uh, we also work very closely with Coast Life Support District here and um, South Coast Fire. And during the storms, uh, South Coast Fire was able to get some generators from PG&E, and we work with them to distribute them and set them up in the blistering rain um, and high winds at the households of people who have um, medical needs that require uh, power. So our community health workers, and actually my husband who doesn't get a choice in volunteering during these times, <laughs> went out in the community for um, over eight hours, were soaking wet, and not only did they deliver the generators, they helped set them up, they provided education for the uh, residents on how to use those safely, where to put them, where not to put them, because um, as you know, we did lose some lives in our community as a result of the um, of misuse of generators. So. That was really important. The fire department wanted to make sure that we were educating the people who were using those. And then we coordinated getting all of those back. And so next time there's a storm or some kind of disaster, we'll do that all over again. Um, during that time, we had a lot of people who are homeless in our community, which you often don't see because we have this beautiful coastline, but people are up in the forest. That's where they stay or they stay in their vehicles. And so we were working a lot to help meet those needs. Uh, making sure people had blankets. A lot of people were soaking wet, so making sure they had dry socks, food, clean water. And much like what our CMS said, our staff was out there doing all of this around the clock when our families were suffering at home, when, when we couldn't rely on county resources to help us. Our community really pulled together and 
and the resiliency is prevalent here. It's that's what we do. You can't live here without being resilient. But um, it does make it very difficult for us to return back to work the next Monday when everything's okay again. When you know all of the all of the staff responding to these disasters don't have sometimes the skill, but we're thrown into it. Don't have the time, um, but we're thrown into it, and we. We also don't have the ability to pay attention to our family when they need us the most. So, um, you know, that was our experience and we'll do it again. You know, that's what we're here for. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, I was wondering if you received any outreach from the Department of Emergency Management or the Office of Equity, because we actually set aside a million dollars to help families recover financially from the January storms. Um, and my understanding, it, it's kind of challenging because we were sort of doing our work, um, you know, through our municipal advisory council and sort of local community representatives. And then things also kind of go into our emergency operations center, which sometimes operates as a bit of a black box. And so we weren't totally clear exactly what community-based organizations they were liaising with, but we did set up kind of a hotline for the North Coast. And I'm wondering if you had access to those funds and resources. We didn't directly, but we did know about the phone number. And so um, there were times where people, it depended on the county because both county has different resources. And so depending on that, we would tell the individuals, okay, here's what we can give you, but also use this. And so if people could get um, grocery gift certificates, which I think you guys were giving a lot of those out, I, if, if I remember. We did debit cards and we yeah. also had some, um, some grocery cards as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we would say, okay, we're going to help you with your wages or with your, your PG&E bill or, you know, once, <laughs> because then people, when they, not only do they lose wages, but then they're backed up on bills, especially for the low-income housing developments in our communities. And so um, we were kind of doing both, like, hey, we'll give you this and then check in with this other resource. Um, but, but a lot of, um, some of our money from the Mendocino Community Foundation went to Sonoma County residents. So, and they understand that. It's like, hey, you, you work with us, you get the whole gamut. You don't just get to pick one part of the service area, so. Like, um, I would love to follow up with you and kind of coordinate more closely in the future so that you have more direct, you know, rather than sort of saying, here, call this phone number, like we're actually talking about now having pre-positioning of emergency funds so that we're ready for the next disaster so that you already sort of have funds and you can activate them and utilize them when the disaster hits rather than having to go through kind of clunky bureaucratic processes in the heat of the moment. So I would love to follow up with you on that, but thank you so much for all the work that you did. Yeah, thank you. And um, the one last thing I will mention is that um, while all of our organizations are able and willing um, to take the brunt of that work, our, our budgets don't really allow for that. And so a lot of us are doing this work for free, and then we're getting, we're getting um, disaster funding to help out the community, but it's going directly to the community. And so especially for nonprofits and, and volunteer fire departments and whatnot, um, that's a really big hit on us financially in the whole fiscal year. And then we ha we're left recovering from that. And it's a part of what we're committed to, so we'll do it, but it's just something that I think is important to talk about. Thank you. Um, so next I'd like to hear from John Prescott from the Sea Ranch Association. Facilities and resources? Resources, so my name is John Prescott. I I'm the Director of Facilities and Resources here at the Sea Ranch Association. Uh, first of all, I really want to acknowledge um, the community and everybody who was up here and spoke. Um, we couldn't have dealt with the storm response without everybody working together. It was a great effort and just very impressive to see. Um, special thanks to uh, Cal Fire and the local volunteer fire departments. Um, they were amazing. and. The Sea Ranch Association being a private community, uh, we have like an eight person crew that can respond to tree damage and storm damage uh, without the help of Cal Fire and volunteer fire departments and local tree contractors from the area, Seafelt and Gonzalez Tree Services in particular. There is no way we could have helped manage our own community, which has approximately 50 miles of private roads. So um, just want to thank everybody for that. And speaking to that, we're still to this day, our crew has not been doing anything but working on the cleanup from that storm. 
So of course there was the response and now we're two and a half months into it. We haven't been doing anything but tree cleanup related to that storm. Um, we lost somewhere between 800 and 1,000 trees on the Sea Ranch. Um, Susie might know the number of calls that we all responded to that day. It, it was a lot. Um, we had a couple miles of fence on the Highway 1 that's down. We had some minor damages to some of our facilities. And I believe there's at least maybe a dozen homes that took some kind of damage, either major or minor damage from the storm. Um, and yeah, there was, there was a lot. So I'm just looking at cleanup in general. Um, we're gonna be cleaning up from this storm all year long. Um, there are trees down there that we don't, out there in the comments that we don't even know are there yet. We're still getting calls in about new trees down. Um, and we're waiting for the, the ground to dry out. We can't even get out into the commons or some of our trail areas uh, until the ground firms up. So we've been focusing on what we can get from the roads. Um, yeah. So it's just a, it's a giant undertaking, but um, you know, working together and we'll, we'll, we'll get it done. Thank you so much, John, for all of your work and for your staff and your dedication. So, Susie Gilley, the Sea Ranch Association's emergency manager, and, and she had a, a doozy of a time. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take it, just take it out and hold it. Actually, the title is now safety and security manager. Okay. Um, but the majority of my life is emergency management and working closely with the county and all the um, uh, organizations there. Um, I participate in a weekly call with the county, so we have updates from, from all around. Um, that storm was predicted to be a good one, um, and yet they even underestimated that. Um, we fielded close to 200 calls that came into security um, and worked with uh, all the fire agencies um, and 911 dispatch to get as many of the calls taken care of as quickly as possible. And never ceases to amaze me how wonderful this community and our sister communities work together every day without storms they save lives and this was another true test of just that um our I'm happy to report that our officer that was in the vehicle that had the tree come down on it was fine. Aired on the phone at the time with 911 calling in another emergency and backed up to check out the address of the one he was responding to when the tree came down on the car. Had he not backed up, it would have hit the cab and the story might have been quite different. In my role as a manager, um, we try and anticipate all the different types of emergencies that our community could go through. And we found that this was probably better than any tabletop exercise we could have <laughs> dreamed up. <laughs> um, I'm happy to say that uh, we were able to respond when it was safe to do so and send our division leaders and our damage assessors out to help. We had a good list uh, prepared and ready for when FEMA, Cal OES, and the county uh, arrived to surprise us with help. We're going to come and look at everything. Um, so I thank you very much for, for coming and, and uh taking care of all that. Um, we had a good list, many more than what they had on their list. So we were able to implement that. So the training that the county gave our division leaders and damage assessors was put to good use in surveying the areas. Um, 
We did take a little bit of criticism because we didn't put everybody out there right away. Well, we wanted to make sure that they were safe. When your fire department, your first responders pull out, you're not sending your membership out there as volunteers to put them in harm's way. So we held back. The other thing we did was uh, we made sure that we kept our officers out of the heavy treed areas and um, because we couldn't afford to lose one more vehicle or have anybody else in harm's way. So uh, for a few days, we pulled them in, uh, secured the buildings, pulled them in and had them uh, in the office fielding calls there. And of course, responding as, as necessary. So um, it was, a, a, like I said, another wonderful um, adventure here. Um, and one thing that I would like to point out is that this was a rainstorm. Yes, it was a bomb cyclone. It was a bad one. But what are we going to do when the ground moves? When the big one comes, it's going to be longer. So we need to be more prepared. Um, and the second thing is prepositioning of pharmaceuticals since we no longer have a pharmacy. You've heard the road closures. For the last five years, I've tried to work with uh, the county to get some prepositioned pharmaceuticals. And um, the best we could do was a flyaway list of things that are retired and still active medical doctors put together to um, have pre-positions that could be flown in or dropped in for us. So uh, that's another thing that, that we really need to address. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Okay. Um, I'm going to give testimony from Jeff McFarland, superintendent, principal of Corican Schools. They are on uh, spring break. And he had hoped to zoom in from vacation, but the hotel he's at does not have Wi-Fi that's big enough to, you know, to do that. So thank you, Supervisor Hopkins, for taking the time to hear from local leaders and residents regarding how the powerful winter storm cycle has impacted the local area. I'm representing Horican Elementary School District but feel I can sufficiently speak to the impact these storms had on our local area schools and students as my wife teaches at Point Arena High School and I have been supporting the needs of the Kashaya Elementary School District. These unprecedented storms wreaked havoc on the road conditions with fallen trees, flooding, landslides, and downed power lines. At a daily basis, families were scrambling to figure out how to travel when safe, to get supplies, navigate connecting with employers and employees regarding closures, and keep warm and fed with dwindling supplies. Neighbors banded together to support where supplies were short, shared meals and generators, and passed along information for those who lacked any access to the outside world. The initial storm cycle closed school for two solid weeks due to unsafe or closed conditions. There were shortages of fuel, food, medicine, and other critical supplies. All of this said, the roads crews were a vital component in avoiding what easily could have been a far worse situation. Thankfully, we only had two deaths in the local area that attributed to a misuse of a generator indoors. We ask that a regular presence of roads crews in our area remain permanent during the winter, as it specifically is what will prevent a wider disaster in the future. Their work was and remains vital. Additionally, an ongoing plan for forestry management is critical as there are dead and dying trees littered through the area as they have reached their maturity and are at their end of life. Lastly, local shelters stocked with generators and emergency water and food supplies may be necessary during the next few winters until the tree work can be completed and the power lines can be fully repaired. Thank you again for your time and attention to this vital work. And now I'd like to ask Leanne Lindsay from KGUA Radio and Peggy Berryhill. 
from KGA Radio to come. Well, first of all, thank you so much to all the network of first responders. Uh, and KGOA is a critical component of that. Uh, it is a fully volunteer, independent public radio station located in Gualala at the Cypress Village. And we are supported by donors and sponsors. I became a volunteer back in January of 18. I'm a local media producer, and we, as volunteers, wear many hats. And the GM and founder of the station is Peggy Berryhill, along with her partner, Susan Rushmeyer, a land, uh, land surveyor. And together they built the tower and the station about 15 years ago. Peggy has been on public radio for over 50 years. She was the first Native American on NPR ever. And since then, many Native Americans have followed her in becoming announcers, journalists, as well as station owners and managers. And she is going to give you, us an update on what we do for the community in providing updates uh, locally and it's online as well, as far as road closures and flooding and networking with all of the first responders. So Peggy, I, go ahead. I'm gonna give you the mic since I'm not gonna lower it. <laughs> Thank you, Leanne. Thank you, supervisors, for being here. And all of, I, I too want to thank all the first responders who are here because you are the ones that keep all of us safe and uh, you try and safe, be safe as well. TGUA is a community radio station and we take our role seriously. We have serious fun, but we also, when it comes time for emergencies, we, we come to the station. I don't have to call the volunteers. Leanne, Roberta Chan, Jean Berry, Thane Vervold are our main volunteers. They just show up. And Susan, we show up at the station. And we do from January 4th through January 14th or 15th, we made critical announcements. It took about 15 minutes at the top of every hour to go through everything that needed to be said. Uh, listeners would call in and interrupt programming to give us updates because obviously we're now out on the air, out in the ground. We kept an active Facebook presence for those who could access uh, Facebook. We had in-person interviews with South Coast Fire Chief Jason Warner, CLSD head David Crowell, advising us to tell residents to stay home. And in fact, no matter how often we make those announcements, stay off the road, stay home, we still get calls from people saying, but I have a doctor's appointment. And they say, your doctor's not gonna be there. Please stay off the road. So we did keep up with road closures to the south with Timber Cove Fire Chief Eric Lynn, Caltrans updates via his daughter, a Caltrans employee. We contacted residents at Kashaya and Bokea Rancherias to keep updates from them and to them they're fairly isolated. Uh, we had Sheriff Matt Kendall and Supervisor Ted Williams calling us and talking us on, to on the air by phone. Um, KGA staff member Sevi Cardosi was one of the women who cooked at the PG&E man camp that kept everybody fed and uh, the PG&E people taking care of all of us. Uh, it was amazing to see that army of trucks and wherever we went. Uh, we provided charging stations. Now, this is the first year in our, uh, this kind of emergency where people just showed up at the station because they needed to plug in their phones or their laptops, whatever, and we let them do that uh, as much as we could. So we had, uh, we had a little party at the station. Every time we'd have groups of people coming in, it was so important to us and, of course, important to them. The, yeah, a couple of years ago, we had an automatic generator put in because we had a portable generator during that. Uh, I think that was the fire emergencies, wasn't it? The PSPS. We, anyway, I, we had uh, Susan and I came in and actually slept on the floor at the station for three nights, five nights. Was it five? Thank you, Leanne. Five nights because we needed to be there 
to fuel the portable generator, but also to be there in case of any immediate updates that we needed to let people know. So we now have a generator that is automatic and turns on. The other thing, speaking of generators, the other thing we did, and you, you've mentioned this, is we spent a lot of time announcing safety for generators, safety for camp stoves and candles, because a lot of people had those to rely on and a lot of people don't realize the danger of propane. And so we, we tried to keep people safe. The other thing is that we informed the community about the availability of sandbags, generators, South Coast Fire Department, South Coast Seniors, meal deliveries, firewood, home health, RCMS, Mendenoma Health Alliance, as Micheline was saying, we, we helped support them as much as we could. Um, there was such a call out for diapers and blankets, you know, and remember it was cold this because of the rain. Which kids? Yeah. Yeah, they did. We had, I think the fire department gave us uh, the, these kits and they were giving them out down at Timber Cove and um, locally, I think up at, our, uh, at the fire department. But they had a, a blanket and they had like a food snack and several things in them. And we made sure that we distributed those as well. And of course, for the MTA, which really wasn't running, but to let people know, again, trying to keep people off the roads. People just don't want to stay off the roads. Uh, so that's how we handled it for how many days it was this past one. Yeah, the, the 4th through the 15th, something like that. Every day we would be there. Uh, we would give these 15 minutes or 20 minutes announcements up until about 6 uh, in the evening because we needed to get a break <laughs> ourselves and get a little bit of rest and check on uh, how things were going in our own neighborhood. So that's what we do. We are also all volunteers. Uh, we rely on funds from the community. We don't currently have any grants, federal or local grants, and but we see our job for what it is. And yes, I've been in community radio for all these years, and I know that community is more important than, than all of the, the national shows we play, uh, all the other things that we do. But in times of emergency, we are there for you. And I want to thank all the people have still been stopping me, even in the past week, saying thank you for being there. Thank you for being there. And we have people who listen on their car radios as well. So that's what KDU is. <laughs> Thank you, Leigh. Yes, we have a huge tower that has to keep running. Actually, it's a small tower in terms of radio, but whatever it is, 105 feet and the transmitters and the generators up there. That we have to feed and keep going. Just, would you like to do a pitch? <laughs> And PG&E bills, so all of that. And again, we do this as volunteers, not because we want to be volunteers, but because it has to be done. We didn't build this to uh, become rich, but we did it to provide community services and community voices. So anything else? <laughs> okay, thank, thank you very you much. so much. Okay, now the anchor is Mankasethi, and this January 4th was her third day in office <laughs> with her new job as community manager for the Sea Ranch Association. Thank you. And thank you to Supervisor Hopkins for taking the time to be here today. And also, um, for those of you who don't know, Supervisor Hopkins came up in the middle of the storms. This is not her first time visiting us here. Um, she spent a good morning with us um, and with some of the other emergency responding partners in the room to see firsthand what happened. So we're incredibly grateful for your support. And I, um, I'm i gonna be the cheerleader for some of the people you've already heard from because they're too modest to talk about the extent of what they did to keep all of us safe in the region. And that's John Prescott and, and Susie Gilly. John mentioned his crew of eight. He actually has a team of 38 people and every one of them contributed in their own way um, when people did not have power, we opened our recreation centers to keep people warm, to provide beverages and food, to allow people to charge their devices. Um, when FEMA and SBA came here, they used the database that Susie 
created um, to partner with the, the fire agencies, the volunteer fire department in the region. Um, we shared our GIS database so that they could uh, track property damage to help us qualify in the county um, for certain emergency declarations. And I think you saw from Susie directly um, how much it means to her to keep all of us safe. And I had to ask Susie to go home after 48 hours of not going home and give her half a sandwich because she hadn't eaten in two days. That's the level of dedication that our team has. Um, and Susie mentioned our division leaders and our damage assessors. What is that? That's a network of 100 plus or minus volunteers who knocked on doors. We found uh, octogenarian members who hadn't eaten in three days, who had no phone service. Oh, that was a sign from the gods to stop talking, Menka. Um, so I don't want to underestimate, we are not a public agency, but given the rural nature of where we're located, we do act as um, the Sea Ranch Association as a quasi-governmental agency. And I, I don't want that to fly under the radar because it means so much um, to the region to keep us to keep us safe. And when I think about what's needed ahead, um, we're starting to look at the lessons that we learned from the storm, all of our critical infrastructure gaps um, so that we're not only ready the next time a storm happens, but what do we need to do so that the impacts we, we endure are, are much less. And I think that's where we would love to explore the conversation um, on funding partnerships, on regulatory partnerships. I'm grateful you mentioned um, efforts to streamline vegetation management permits through the local coastal plan. I guarantee you, John Prescott, the CAL FIRE team, the local fire um, volunteer district and others are the experts in how to keep us safe. It is very scary to think that a statewide entity would put in place um, measures that may not apply to hyper-local ecosystems. I would like you know, to partner with the county on how to really figure that out. Um, and then also, I want to highlight that not only are we an HOA, but we have our own water infrastructure system that we opened up to the, the neighboring Kashaya tribe when they did not have sufficient water. We're the county's um, contractor, and we're grateful for the wastewater system here. Both the water and the wastewater systems uh, continued throughout the storms. And that's because some of you may have seen a video I showed in um, early February. One of our teammates happened to be wearing a GoPro. And it was in the dark of night. You could see the rain. It wasn't coming down. It was going um, horizontal. It was so fast. And the winds, I think Bonnie had measured she keeps a running track of the, the peak wind gusts for each day. And that was the 88 mile an hour day at that time. And what was he doing? He was taking our portable generators and going from lift station to lift station to make sure that we don't have effluent running into the Pacific Ocean. So these are the stories that because we're private, we're not a government agency, they don't often get told, um, but they're my team, they're our community, and I would be remiss to not mention it. So thank you for all the partners for being here for today, for serving our community. We're grateful to the supervisor um, for making the time. We're far away, and I know that we're not far outside your heart. So I'm really, thank you. And thank you, Linda, for um, McCabe for pulling this together today. Thank you. So um, now, it, because we're only supposed to be here till noon, um, maybe we'll forego the bio break. Anyone at home that needed one, you can go do it. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions and so, um, or statements from people here in the hall first. If there's, an, oh, I see Paula Smith coming. <laughs> and so she will be here soon. I have two questions. One's fun. The sea otters, they brought them here before and they all swam back to Monterey. <laughs> so how would you keep them here? Or why don't you just let them as they 
normally gradually extend their range? I can actually answer that. Um, they've learned a lot about sea otter reintroduction from failed experiments. Previously, they were actually introduced to offshore islands, and they learned that actually sea otters don't really like being on offshore islands. They much prefer um, being in sort of protected bays and coves. And so they've actually had a lot of um, sort of luck reintroducing them to Elkhorn Slough. And, um, and so now there's an entire sort of sea otter like tourism, you can go out kayaking and, and, you know, view the sea otters. And they also learned that rather than like catch and release, actually sea otters that were raised um, through sort of a fostering system at um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium and the sort of new, nearby um, Ambari Research Institute was actually, they were more likely to actually stay locally than kind of catching them and putting them. Because I think if you catch them from one place and put them in another place, they kind of always want to try to go back to that original place. And they also learned there was a higher rate of mortality on the offshore islands as a result of great white shark attacks, which is actually one of the kind of biggest predators of the sea otter. So kind of the near shore protected cove habitat. And so um, currently researchers think that actually Bodega Bay, which used to have like four to 6,000 sea otters um, before they were all killed for pelts would be a, a very prime um, relocation spot. And then from there, they would likely repopulate sort of along the coast in you know, neighboring inlets and, um, and potentially where there are little outlets from creeks and things like that. That would be great. Um, a great question, because yeah, it's no good if you bring them here and then they're gone. Well, Peggy and Leanne just told you how important KGOA is. Can they get some FEMA money? Um, so FEMA money is you really- You wouldn't make the pitch, I will. Complex, <laughs> but I was actually thinking, um, you know, that because there's such a benefit to the North Coast, Absolutely. and I really actually appreciate also even from the Mendonoma Health Alliance, like, you know, the line between Mendocino and Sonoma counties is an imaginary line in the woods. It doesn't matter, right? Your health services are across that line, right? So much of the resources are shared. We actually contract with bus services, right? With Mendocino County um, that I would really encourage KGUA to apply for a tourism impact fund grant. Um, we just dispersed tourism impact fund um, both to Chief Placos as well as Chief Lynn at Timber Cove Fire to do a little bit more of that kind of disaster preparedness and readiness. So if there is a generator need at KGUA, or if there is, you know, some kind of like, please talk to us and we would love to um, entertain a grant application because even though you're not in Sonoma County, right, your listeners are. And so I think that there's a critical need in terms of disaster resilience with your organization. They downplayed how essential they were. They're the only game in town. So I, I would be glad to, you know, see it happen. We, I would love to um, support and, and accept an application. So the impact fund or the community um, investment funds. And we can, um, we can get you that link. We can follow up if we get your, your email addresses and we'll connect you to those resources. Um, while we're waiting for the next person to come up, I just wanna, um, if it's okay, reflect back on a couple of the things that were said. Um, number one, I think you have some of the best first responders really anywhere in the country here. Um, and one of the things that we talked about when I was touring some of the damage and we were debriefing right in the heat of the moment when you know things were still very fresh was the tremendous need for overnight accommodations. Um, I know that the Sonoma County Fire District reinforcements didn't all the, make it all the way up to you, but they were very helpful in the Timber Cove area. However, they had to go back home right away because there was nowhere for them to sleep, even though they actually could have sort of stayed on shift and stayed present. And so, you know, another thing that we just provided a grant for was to, for Timber Cove to hire a grant writer to start looking at what kind of infrastructure can we develop on the North Coast to support those kinds of overnight accommodations, specifically for first responders. Um, and then I also just wanted to um, reflect back on something that Susie brought up and that I had actually written in my notes even before you said it was two things, prepositioning of supplies. And I just added and pharmaceuticals when, because you mentioned that, and then also the fact that unfortunately what we saw in January was not the worst case scenario. And in my mind, an earthquake is the worst case scenario because if it hits the urban Bay area, we will not have the mutual aid up here that you saw during the January storms. That will go all to the urban Bay area and then make its way up the 101 corridor to Santa Rosa. And it could be weeks. So we will truly be on our own in West County. And then, which I think further reinforces the need for that pre-positioning of supplies. And those are kind of some of the big picture things that I would love to work with all of you on. Pre-positioning of supplies, not only physical supplies, um, but also, you know, the community communications infrastructure, right? Through the radio and also the financial resilience and the need for some of our most socioeconomically disadvantaged community members through, you know, pre-positioning of financial resources at local nonprofits. Um, so I'm really just so grateful for all of the work that you've done. And I think the points that came out of this meeting 
give us some impetus for what the next steps are. So I just wanted to say that and, and say thank you all for your work and your comments. We're both, Leo and I, it's Leo is our um, fifth district director over there and we're both taking notes for, for follow-up items. Excellent. So um, I guess Ms. Shaleen wants to speak again. Okay. Just want to mention three things quickly. Sorry. Um, the first thing, one of us will get this right. Yeah. Okay. So the first thing is that um, when it comes to housing, it was a big issue because we have staff that travels inland or from inland to get here. One of them is a peer recovery support coordinator for people who are in recovery from addiction. And um, while that's not like a first response type situation, um, when that person's not here, we have a whole group of people who really count on those meetings to get through the day sometimes. And so we had to cancel meetings and for us as an organization that felt really bad. You know, it's like, we're not serving the needs of the people. Obviously there are crazy circumstances that led to that, but I'm glad that you brought up the housing because that is important. We tried to get somewhere for him to stay locally so he didn't have to leave and then try to come back. And it was just impossible. Um, and so the other thing I was gonna mention is that Mendonoma Health Alliance is launching a primary care mobile clinic. And our purpose of that clinic is to reach our most underserved distant communities, which include Timber Cove all the way up through Manchester Irish Beach. We're gonna start operating it two days a week. Um, but the, the really cool thing about this mobile clinic is that the other intention is it for it to be used in emergency situations. So um, Jason and I have had conversations we're gonna work out a deal where we can store it on one of their properties. But, um, but the advantage is it's there. So if something happens to the clinic, if roads are drivable, if a big emergency happens, we'll be able to take that vehicle out and meet people where they are. So I um, just wanna make sure you guys know about that because 50% of the reason we're doing it is because of Timber Cove and Fort Ross area. We're gonna focus there first. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to mention was the airstrip, what happened to the Wallala airstrip, which I know is a privately owned airstrip, but even today we, um, we had some emergency in our office, our network system blew up and we're trying to get our IT person here. He was going to fly in. He can't fly in anywhere. And so our services are impacted. Like we don't have a phone system right now. We don't have the ability to share files right now. And we don't have the ability to get somebody here fast as a result of that storm. So we're still seeing impacts today. And that impacts the people that we should be serving today. So, and those are Sonoma County residents as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there a um, gentleman over here? Did you want to speak? That's fine. And if anyone on Zoom wants to speak, raise your hand up and then Scott Ignacio will try to recognize you. Hi, I'm John Walton. Uh, Linda, the last time I saw you was here when we were just going after Mill Bend. And uh, I know that uh, the county was limited because it's in Mendocino County, but I, I thank you for your support through that. I'm pleased to say that we now have a plan to extend the coastal trail from behind the view restaurant all the way to the river. And we're, one, we're just beginning the arduous process of working with Caltrans to get people's bikes and peds safely across the river. So you'll be hearing from us or we hope that you'll support that effort. We know it's a long haul, it'll take a lot, but we wanna get that started because I think connecting people across the bridge that aren't in vehicles is an important thing to do. So I just want to put that out there. Now I'm taking my RCLC hat off. Uh, I wanted to ask about the well ordinance that I just got passed, is that correct? Is there a recharge component? I know in some states they're doing pumping to get water back into the uh, ground. Is, it, is there a component in, in this? Great question. Um, so on, on the first, 
absolutely will support that effort and, you know, count me in for whatever it is, you know, reaching out and convening meetings with state legislators. Um, you know, McGuire's really great at, if anyone can bust through the bureaucracy that is Caltrans, he is the person that I go to to do that. Um, number two, so um, the well ordinance that we were looking at wasn't holistic management of groundwater. It was limited to the permitting of new wells um, or replacement wells for existing wells. And so we did actually exempt from any review process or, you know, the sort of additional review, it's still going to obviously, you know, be managed by an engineering professional and go through a simple ministerial permitting process, but any recharge wells um, essentially get the green automatic green light as opposed to additional discretionary review. And actually one of the things that I talked about a bit at the board meeting was how do we create incentives? Um, so including around sort of groundwater recharge, um, incentives for voluntary monitoring of existing wells, and then also incentives for uh, water efficiency measures. So that is definitely something that we're looking at. It's something that we're also very aggressively pursuing through our groundwater sustainability agencies. Unfortunately, there's not a, well, fortunately, unfortunately, I probably would say fortunately, there's not a GSA in this area because it has um, added quite a bit of expense to areas that have sparse populations. Um, but because this wasn't considered sort of a critical groundwater area, um, it is not under the regulation of a groundwater sustainability agency, which Santa Rosa is right now. And we're actually actively looking at what projects can we create to offset the withdrawals that are occurring. Thank you. Uh, another question about what was the final amount that was landed on as appropriate capacity for a, a single family dwelling? Excellent question. And so um, what we came up with was two acre feet per year, which some people said um, was too high because the sort of average user is about a half an acre foot per year. But what we had to take into account was we weren't just looking at rural residential par um, parcels that were on small lots. This would actually apply to diverse agriculture zone parcels that are on 10 acres or 20 acres or people who have you know three or four acres and have some de minimis, like for personal use, agricultural use of their property, which is actually allowed by right in the general plan. And so um, what staff recommended was two acre feet per year as kind of the de minimis water user, which would allow for that half acre foot for one family, about a quarter of an acre foot estimated for an ADU, which are also allowed by right, another quarter acre for a junior ADU, which are also allowed by right, and then about an acre foot for your orchard or backyard garden. Is the, will the there be any monitoring of the use? So there will be monitoring um, for the non um, kind of de minimis uh, wells, including replacement wells. So anyone who has um, sort of, and, and, and in order to kind of qualify for the de minimis, you actually are going to have to sort of submit, even though you won't have well records because you don't have a monitor, what the use of your property is with estimates for use. So staff's going to be working over the next year to kind of come up with basically algorithms and spreadsheets to kind of quantify what the average water use is for say you have a quarter acre of vegetables, you have a half an acre of mostly dry farm, but a little bit of water use orchard, um, that kind of thing. So, so we will have monitors going on to all replacement wells and new wells that are in excess of the two acre feet. Mm -hmm. Scott Smith, the Sea Ranch. Thank you, Linda. Um, my ears perked up when uh, Minka said something about outside agencies having overview of our vegetation management in the case of, the, of this past storm. In the last, uh, in the last three months, I guess, you could say that our vegetation management practices on Sea Ranch have undergone unprecedented changes that we had before. I'm just wondering if briefly, Linda, Menka, John, could explain the, some of these outside forces and how they regulate uh, what we're doing here in terms of our management. I'll take it offline as Peggy would say. Okay, so maybe I can start and then hand it over to you. So, um, so sort of what we're referring to is um, the role of the Coastal Commission, um, who ultimately has um, sort of the authority over coastal zone land use. And what we do at the county side of things is we come up with a local coastal plan um, that then goes to, has to be first go through the Planning Commission, then be approved by the Board of Supervisors, and then goes to the Coastal Commission for formal approver, approval. Through that local coastal plan, we can actually do some permitting processes ministerially through county government. Other things require a coastal development permit and actually have to go ultimately um, sort of through the Coastal Commission. And what we are seeing, unfortunately, 
is that even just trying to do defensible space around your home, even trying to cut down a dead tree that is likely to go into your roof the way that, you know, Bonnie shared those photos earlier, um, actually requires a coastal development permit, um, which anytime there's something that has, you know, a discretionary element to it, there's environmental review components, you know, and, and what we want to try to do is we want to try to work with um, our subject matter expert partners, folks, um, you know, like Marshall from, um, from CAL FIRE, and um, as well as Matt Green, local registered professional forester and other fire agency heads, including Chief Plakos, um, Chief Lynn, and I think we're going um, sort of down to, well, really, we're invited everyone who touches the coast. So even including all the way down to Chief Baxman and Chief Hine, who now um, covers Bodega Bay. Um, but try to see if we can create ministerial processes so it's essentially automatic. So that if CAL FIRE says that you can do it, or actually CAL FIRE mandates that you do it, that you can do it without having to go through a discretionary review process. And I think that one thing that's happening right now is a bit of friction. Um, if, 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 and I'll, I'll look at Chief Turbeville and, and see if that's sort of safe to say that there's a little bit of friction between CAL FIRE and the Coastal Commission with the Coastal Commission kind of honestly wanting to kind of exert jurisdictional authority over matters that quite frankly, they are not subject matter experts in. And, um, and so it's, it's creating a little bit of tension over sort of who really has the right to say, yes, this is appropriate to remove these trees or to limb them up. Um, you know, is it the Coastal Commission or is it the subject matter experts at CAL FIRE who are the ones who are going to respond when there's a wildfire and there is, are unsafe conditions around someone's home and they can't literally defend it because it is unsafe to do so. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of hand it over um, to Menka and I don't know, um, Marshall, if you have anything to add or, or Bonnie on that subject matter. You're gonna just give us all the solutions next Monday, right? But come on up, I, I feel like it'd be helpful to... I'll just weigh in super briefly and Scott, happy to chat with you offline. I was referring to the, the new proposed LCP policy um, with Coastal Commission oversight. And you know, the Coastal Commission has an incredibly important mission to ensure access to the coast. Um, getting plans approved through the Coastal Commission could in and of itself take many, many years. Um, and if that's gonna be the re requirement um, the amount of time it takes and expense um, to get those through could impact the rapidly changing climate conditions that we're starting to see. Um. I'll just mention that I really appreciate the Board of Supervisors um, giving some extra time to look at these relatively newly added things, uh, things that were added to the LCP just only the first week of February after the seven year process. Um, and that hopefully next week will be a really big step in, in finding a way to do it where we're, we're protecting resources, but we're allowing homeowners to, uh, to actually get work done without having to jump through a lot of hoops or just make it you know, so expensive they can't do it. So let's hopefully we'll get some, some, some good traction next week. And then, yeah, the hope is that we can actually get it through the Coastal Commission, which will be the next step. Maybe we can collaborate on support. I have a quick question. I remember last year that the Sonoma County was going through the long process of updating the, com the community wildfire protection plan. Where is that now? Has it been approved yet? It's coming before the board in the next few months. I just saw it on the calendar of significant items and probably if we let Marshall talk, I'm guessing Leo can pull it up and find out where, when that is happening. Okay, thanks. Second week of May. Oh, damn, you were fast. <laughs> cool. <laughs> First week of May is fire, wildfire prevention week, and it would have been cool if it could have been timed well for that, but it's the week after, I believe. Okay. Um, I want to call Jim Ray, um, if you can unmute yourself, because you got your hand up. I'd like to uh, express my appreciation for Supervisor Hopkins, all, all the time she's spending with us today, and just the amazing stories of the first responders during the January storms. But I wanted to talk about a, a separate issue. I represent a, a number of Sea Ranch Association members who are concerned about beach access and particularly the access at Stengel Beach. Um, you know, we've talked with the board and there's a lot of interest in trying to restore that access. It's been out for over two years. And so I'm just wondering <clears throat> if Supervisor Hopkins can give us a status report on what's happening with that. And let her know that I'm, I'm I'm confident that the Sea Ranch Board is interested in helping and may have some ideas. And then thirdly, I I heard that there may be an interim solution that may be available that's being considered. 
So um, if Supervisor Hopkins can um, comment on all those questions, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely, and thanks for bringing up that critical issue. Um, I tried very hard to get an interim solution and I was shut down. Um, I was told that I was shut down by engineers, but I kind of think I was shut down probably by the lawyers. Um, looking at the, the sort of risk and, and liability. Um, I did actually walk the staircase myself. I have also walked many staircases in Mendocino that are, I think, in worse shape than the Stengel Beach um, staircase and are still open to the public. Um, and so I'm a little bit frustrated that we are going to have to go through um, a lengthy design and review process, um, you know, and permitting process in order to get that beach reopened. But it is looking like we are going to unfortunately have to um, entirely rebuild that staircase. And so it is currently in the design phase um, of that. And if, if you have any, uh, you know, engineers or uh, design experts here at the Sea Ranch, I would love to speak to folks um, who are quite frankly, more educated than I am in the subject matter, which might, um, you know, help me advocate for expediting the process and um, potentially overcome some of the concerns of the attorneys. We have engineers happy to collaborate. Yes. Okay. We have Mark Godfrey. Okay. Uh, she has a, there's a follow-up to that question. Okay, go ahead. And then we'll go to Mark Godfrey. Okay. And Jim, did that cover both of the questions? Did I answer um, adequately? Yes, or anything? I think, okay. Yeah, I, I think it did, unfortunately, but I appreciate the efforts that you're making. I'll make this really quick, Linda and Mika and Linda. Um, but I uh, also got a question from another sea rancher about the Black Point Beach access. Apparently that stairway is very hazardous. I wanted to point that out to you. I don't know about it, but they asked me if I would ask you about that. Secondly, I just wanted to point out that during any emergency, there are another element to uh, the uh, living beings that need to be cared for, and that's our cherished love little pets and big pets and horses or all the different animals. I covered a story after the Paradise Fire for the radio station, went over in Chico area and did a complete you know, review with all the different networks of uh, rescue organizations. And Susie Gilley, and all your volunteers, thank you so much for everything you do. And she was at the Equestrian Center just recently, giving us an overview of what's going to happen with all the pets, birds, cats, dogs, horses. Thank you for that update. It's very extensive. So I just wanted to point out that's part of a big disaster, as you all know. Um, one more question from uh, Director Mark Godley, and then I'm going to wrap up. Thanks. So Mark, go ahead and unmute mute yourself. Okay. You're muted. Um, you uh, have to unmute yourself. He's unmuted on my side. Okay, he's not, on, and we can't hear you, Mark, and I don't read lips really well. Okay. <laughs> okay, it's like, I okay. There we go. Okay, you should connect it to audio, speak. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. yes. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Supervisor Hopkins, for all the time you're spending with us. And I want to, in particular, share my thanks with your staff. Um, Leo, over the last couple of years, has um, been incredibly impressive in directing me as a board member and a committee member to get uh, various questions answered. In very impressive, despite every, the more important things he's juggling. Um, my, my question for you, well, it's, it's more of a, a request for the future, um, which is, as you know, we're not a municipality, we're not a governmental agency, even though we have the infrastructure of utilities and, and board of directors that almost act as city councils, et cetera. But given the fact that we're an HOA, um, it seems that that limits us in our ability to apply for funding of various sources. Um, and so our ability to um, receive back funds, whether that be county funds or state funds that we're providing as taxpayers is, is much different uh, given our, our structure. So if there are things you can do um, to give us direction or unlock opportunities for us as essentially a quasi-governmental HOA, it would, it would help us as we're trying to deal with uh, these costs 
um, you know, to to keep our uh, our environment safe and, and our members uh, uh, safe as well. So so thank you for anything you can do in that regard. Absolutely. You know, I want to say that I think that um, the Sea Ranch is actually better run than many of the cities in Sonoma County. And I really mean that. I mean, you are all ahead of the curve, you know, in terms of, I mean, I've been so impressed for so long by your vegetation management program, by the fact that you were able to procure rural broadband before so many communities. Um, I think that the leadership and, you know, you're very lucky to have Munka as well as all of the leadership of the board um, and the fantastic facilities maintenance staff who, I mean, I met John when we were out wearing muck boots, right? After, um, you know, in the midst of the storms and just working so hard. Um, it, you know, we are actually undertaking a governance study in the Lower Russian River because there is increasingly talk of incorporation, or if not incorporation, actually like a community services district model. Um, right now, state law is not very favorable to incorporation, but there are conversations happening through the California State Association of Counties and the League of Cities about maybe it's time to relook at that law because there are so many rural communities that maybe they don't quite want to become cities, but they would like to be able to keep more of their revenue local and have a little bit more control over say their local land use and, and those kinds of decisions. Um, and so, you know, we were able to fund that governance study for the Russian River through uh, the transient occupancy tax revenue that's been earmarked for district formation funds. That's an ongoing revenue source. So if at some point you would be interested in coordinating on a study just to investigate other options, and it doesn't mean you have to do anything. It's basically just look at the pros and cons like what would different models get you? And if quite frankly, there isn't an adequate model available in California, but there are in other states, well, how do we work with our state legislature to actually open up something like a township model, which is sort of incorporation light that um, exists in other states in the country. And so, you know, Bodega Bay has expressed some interest because they could potentially have also like a harbor district or something to kind of manage their own docks and see revenue that way and have a little more control of land use. Um, and there's definitely quite a bit of concern with the Lower Russian River over land use decisions as the housing element is moving forward. Um, so I would be very interested in, in having that conversation. Basically what we can do is we can pay to hire a consultant who then could work directly with you, hold community meetings, run fiscal analysis, um, look at other models and, and then ultimately prepare a report that is available to you as well as members of the public and the Board of Supervisors. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Supervisor Linda Hopkins, everyone here and online. And I wanted to announce our next forum, which is this Saturday, April 15th from 3 to 5 p.m. here and also on Zoom. It'll be a different link. Um, and that one will be Surviving the Next Electrical Outage. It is a joint forum between the Sea Ranch Forum and the Sea Ranch Association's Utilities Committee. And it will be talking about different options for generators and um, other things like that. So um, please come to that. Um, and if you're interested in that, the, the Zoom link is different. So go to the Sea Ranch Forum weebly.com for that link. Um, and you can also, I will be sending out a link for this video once it's uploaded. And if you want to be on our mailing list and you're not here, send me an email either on the website or at the Sea Ranch Forum at gmail.com. And I just got confirmation in an email that I did for a forum in May, because I wanted to change the date and I got confirmation we can do it on Sunday. May 7th from 1 to 3 p.m. And that will be on coastal wildfires safety updates. And some of the same people you saw today will be involved in that um, as well. Thank you. And tradition for the Sea Ranch Forum is that when you get up, you try to bring your chair over to the things and put them away. So that'll help out the FNR crew. Thank you. What, five o'clock, not me, I don't know. Oh, it, there's a meeting today, five o'clock, they need the chairs here? Okay, if so, then we don't have to move them. I, okay, just leave the chairs out, that's easier. Thank you, John, okay. Okay, okay, thank you. 
closing. Let's take a horse. So, um, last of my speech, where is that? Closing the recording at 12.03. Okay, all right, great. Okay, it's like this big more.